Uh, was Jesus the root of Christianity or the fruit of Christianity? Uh, Burton Mack, uh, in a number of books, uh, argues very convincingly to me that uh, you didn't start with one man or one religious movement, that several of them, Christ cults, as he calls some, uh, Jesus movements, as he calls others, eventually came together under the same umbrella. And uh, I, I once wrote to him and asked him, have I got this right? Are you saying that, uh, that there wasn't one original Christianity? Uh, and he said, yeah, that's right. It's, it's different plants in the same garden until one prevailed. So what would early Christianity have looked like? Uh, well, uh, there probably were, well, we know there were Judaic forms of Christianity where um, Jews who believed in it decided uh, that uh, Jesus is the Messiah and uh, what else would the Messiah do but reinforce Torah observance. Uh, and when they heard that some Christians said, oh, no, no, Jesus came to abolish the law, uh, it sounded hopelessly crazy. Uh, 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 the Jewish Messiah telling people not to bother with the Jewish law, and that can't be, but there were Christians like that. Uh, a lot of them probably culturally assimilated Jews and so-called God-fearers or righteous Gentiles who thought, you know, our religion is, is uh, got a lot of problems. I mean, Zeus is a rapist. Uh, uh, some of the Stoics said, well, no, that, that can't be true. You have to uh, really interpret that as an allegory. But some of them said, no, to hell with it. Uh, these Jews have something better, this ethical monotheism. And they didn't want to get circumcised and keep all the dietary laws, but they did like Judaism and attended synagogue. Well, so there were, uh, and it didn't have to, to keep the Torah. Lots, uh, you Jews doing that, that's okay, but we're, we're sort of at a distance. There must have been a lot of non-Torah observing Christians. There must have been mystical ones who were mainly Gnostics. Uh, and this has become all the clearer in light of the 1945 discovery of the Nag Hammadi, a uh, place they were discovered, uh, Gnostic manuscripts that the monks of St. Pacomius in Egypt had to conceal because they knew the inquisitors were coming and wanted them burned. So they said, well, we're not doing that, but we'll hide them. And in 1945, they were discovered this revealed an amazing array of types of Christianity. Uh, there were Jewish Gnostic groups like the Sethians who had their own theology and who thought that Jesus was the fulfillment, uh, that Jesus was Melchizedek reincarnated. and Or maybe there's another um, savior like Jesus. And there were Zoroastrian Christians. And uh, they thought that uh, Jesus was a, a new manifestation of the heavenly light like, uh, like uh, Zoroaster had been. And there, there seemed to have been mainly philosophical Christians and lo loads of different types that were eventually kind of stamped out or just died on the vine, uh, like uh, Jewish Christianity. And there were several types of that uh, that the church fathers tell us about. Um, uh, the uh, they used the gospel according to the Egyptians, the gospel according to the Hebrews, the gospel according to the Nazareans, etc., etc. Well, Jewish Christians uh, didn't make it in the long run because they were neither fish nor fowl. Uh, Jews didn't want to hear it. They they said, "Yeah, y you may keep the Torah, but." You've made this Jesus into a pagan god. You're just kind of half pagan to get out of here. Uh, whereas um, Gentiles, non-Jews, if you hear one Christian saying, you can believe in Jesus, get baptized, and keep all the laws, and get circumcised, then uh, you'll be saved. But th then next to him, uh, you got a guy saying, no, you don't need to do that. Just believe in Jesus and be baptized. You know, what do you think's going to happen uh, that if Jewish Christians were too Jewish for Gentile converts and too Christian for, for other Jews? So it, it took a couple of centuries, but that pretty much just died out. And uh, some of the others were persecuted to death. 
uh, and, and this radical diversity lasted for uh, at least a couple of more centuries. And Marcionism was, was fabulously successful, but eventually stamped out. Manichaeanism and other Gnostic groups survived underground for a long time. So what is the uh, what was the original Christianity? You can't really tell. Uh, you've got a garden of different flowers, and uh, they, despite attempts to stamp all but one out, uh, they 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 thrive for a long time. And that 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 was like today's denominationalism is nothing compared to that. I mean, they're fighting over, should we baptize kids or adults? Should we sprinkle or use the fire hose? Uh, the, these uh, things are trivial compared to the, the different uh, types of early Christianity, some of which are, are being revived here and there. Some people are using these Nag Hammadi Gnostic texts as their Bible. And uh, I say, uh, let a hundred flowers bloom. That's easy for me to say. I don't really have a a dog, or should I say a god in the race anymore, but I just find that fascinating. Christianity is heavily indebted to contemporary um, religions uh, like the mystery religions, where you, the, which just means the initiation religions, and there were plenty of them. The, the idea was that you could uh, pass into a higher spiritual condition, like Buddhism says, uh, and and perhaps gain immortality that way. And uh, you had to be uh, initiated. All sorts of different rituals were practiced by the different groups. But in most of them, the idea was uh, there is a myth of the divine savior, often including his death and resurrection, and the ritual baptism, uh, the Eucharist, uh, Lord's Supper, uh, they had various things like that in them, like the Osiris religion, which started in Egypt but was widespread over the Mediterranean. There was a sacred meal where you would eat um, bread because it was the body of Osiris, who was the grain god, and you would drink wine or beer uh, because that was the blood of, of the, the grain god. And uh, when you look at uh, the Last Supper in the Gospels, it's supposed to have something to do with Passover, but it doesn't really. Whereas when Jesus says, this bread is my body, this wine is my blood, you think, this doesn't sound like Judaism to me. And, and it looks like it's an importation from these, these other religions of Dionysus, Osiris, or plenty of them. Well, some scholars for a long time have said, geez, this has to come into Christianity from these sources. Well, nobody thinks there was a historical Dionysus or Osiris or Adonis or a Baal. No, obviously not. I mean, today there are Krishna worshippers. There was never any historical Krishna. Uh, and so forth. The Mithraism, which was the official Roman religion for a while, there was no Mithras. Uh, nobody thinks that. Uh, and, and so it's not that odd to think. I mean, was there a historical founder of Hinduism? It's doubtful whether Moses ever existed or the Buddha. There are real good reasons to doubt that. Uh, and uh, so it, it's not difficult difficult to imagine how the mystery religions and Gnosticism, which posited a divine savior coming to earth to reveal the truth, very much like in the Gospel of John, and uh, all the miracle stories, and even the crucifixion, you find this in contemporary Greco-Roman novels. A uh, hero gets uh, condemned to the cross or actually crucified, but manages to escape it. And then you think, is the gospel story much different from this? Uh, is Jesus is depicted like a, a Greco-Roman hero, a, a demigod or whatever. And I don't think these things are coincidences. It seems to me we just have a have one more confluence of these religious ideas that were current and in the air and embraced by many, many people. Stoicism, cynicism, that you can find both of those uh, uh, on display in the New Testament. Uh, leave your family and your property. Uh, that's Diogenes and the cynics. Uh, and so on and so forth, it's, it's very difficult to find anything that is unique in early Christianity 
And that's kind of true of all the religions of the day, and kind of true of religions today. Uh, Ernst Kesemann once said that the, there are loads of contradictions in the New Testament simply because uh, they, the various parts were written by different sectarian groups, so everybody's got a chunk of property there. I think it's tragic when people create trouble for themselves by trying to harmonize all the contradictions. Oh, they're not really contradictions. They can be made to fit in somehow. You're just creating a Bible that isn't there. Uh, you're just re uh, interpreting it in an unrealistic way, forcing it. It's good that the contradictions are there because they are, are little loose ends that enable you to tug on them and see how did this contradiction happen? Uh, are these two different types of Christianity, two different authors that, that are contradicting each other? If, if they are, that tells us something we wouldn't have known about early Christianity. And once you realize that, is it, it's not just goofs like a bunch of idiots wrote this. No, there's a way of understanding it whereby you can, you can decode it and see uh, who believed what. I love uh, what uh, F.C. Bauer said uh, that uh, anything is possible. We weren't there. We don't know. What the historian concerns himself with is what is probable, what probably happened. Uh, and uh, that's all you can ask and all you can establish, which is why all historical judgments are tentative and provisional. Uh, you have to say, looks this way. Uh, we, we weren't there, we don't know, but uh, all you can do, the only coin you can spend is probability. And it may turn out differently one day. So uh, how do you uh, uh, determine what is probable? Well, there's a few criteria. Uh, one is uh, connectivity, or uh, uh, I forget the German for it, um, historische Zusammenhang, that was it, historical connection. If you don't know when so-and-so epistle was written, uh, the best you can do, perhaps, is to see, well, how does this, uh, do, does this seem to fit in with this era or that? Like uh, Walter Schmidt also argued that 1 Corinthians sounds a whole lot like Gnosticism, which we usually consider a second century phenomenon. So either it started a lot earlier or this was written a lot later. You, you can't assume it just sticks out like a sore thumb as an anachronism. So what's the, what historical context does it fit? Uh, also, um, uh, the, uh, the idea of analogy. If, uh, if, like, historians don't discount that miracles could have happened, we don't have a time machine, we can't go back and film it. Uh, so you have to say that if you read in a story that one man using a dried-out jawbone killed a thousand men, you got to ask yourself, uh, is there any historical analogy to this? Can you even imagine uh, what all these Philistines line up for Samson to kill one by one with his bone? No! It's not that miracles are impossible, but this just defies analogy. Nobody has ever seen anything like this and cannot imagine it. Now, maybe something weird was going on that we don't know, but until you show some reason to think so, we have to say it's, it's more like a legend than a piece of history, and so we regard it as very probably a legend. So analogy, historical connection, and provisionality, these things... Uh, show that we can only render a judgment of probable or improbable.